Hello and welcome to another episode of the Alpha Movement Podcast. My name is Tom Foxley and on today's show I am joined by Mr. Yami Tikkanen. Now, if you don't know who Yami is, um, basically where the hell have you been for the last however many years? He's an incredible coach in a, a massive name in the CrossFit community. He's one of the coaches that has shaped me as a coach and as an athlete um, he's worked with huge names such as Annie Thorisdotter he runs the training plan he is um, just someone that is a very deep introspective thinker about um, not only CrossFit and movement but in life in general and he's an incredible man to have on the show um, I'm sure you'll love 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 this show just like I did side note if you want to support the Alpha Movement podcast you can do that so if you head to patreon.com slash alpha movement podcast and there you'll find an option to donate however much you want to um, each episode of the alpha movement podcast i looked at it like buying me a cup of coffee to say thank you for making uh, hopefully an awesome episode um, you guys can be the judge of that otherwise just head to itunes facebook search us out leave us five star review and we will highly highly appreciate it so let's get on with the show and here is mr yami tikkanen Welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you very much for having me. No worries. It's, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show and uh, kind of hopefully we can learn from some, some of your awesome experience. I thought we'd start out with where did you, or how did your, start, uh, your coaching experience begin? Um, I started coaching at a pretty young age. Um, <laughs> my first coaching experiences were in judo, uh, the, about the age of 15, and then moving through uh, solidly through the elderly gymnastics, uh, all martial arts, and then uh, CrossFit, really coaching in CrossFit started about 2009. Um, yeah, and I've been on that ride ever since. Okay. How did the judo coaching begin? Uh, I was competing in judo since age of six, so that's kind of my sports background. And uh, it was just a natural part of that whole journey to, to mastery, especially in martial arts, I think part of it is being a student and part of it is then teaching what you've already learned to others who are younger than you so that you get to benefit from, from that experience as well. Exactly. How did, or were there any lessons that you learned from coaching judo that have really transferred over to your um, application in CrossFit? I think just coaching in general from judo, I think the big thing is the discipline as a uh, you know, as a six-year-old or 10-year-old or 14-year-old, um, I don't think that we naturally have a lot of discipline, a lot of focus. So I think it definitely kept me out of trouble. And it definitely taught me that in order to get good at something, it takes time and it takes discipline. And uh, that concentrated effort, and you have to be present in where you are and not, not somewhere else when you're doing something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. How do you go about creating that presence within firstly yourself and then your athletes? I think uh, I came across something recently that I thought was very meaningful and helpful. It, it was about this concept of waiting. And, and when we are waiting, we are no longer present. We are projecting ourselves into the future. And, and, and I use that a lot now when I realize that I, I'm in a moment and I'm doing something, but I'm thinking of something else. I use that as a guide for myself to think, oh, I, I'm no longer here. I'm, I'm somewhere else and I have to stop waiting for something else to happen. I have to be in this moment now doing what I do because, uh, of course, the, the future is not guaranteed. So the best way to be is to be there. So that's kind of a bit of a, I guess, Buddhist meditation uh, learnings um, that have helped me lately to, to stay more present. Do you have a particular meditation practice that you follow? I think, you know, I, I think that the, the, the trend nowadays is the, the Headspace app. And I think it is tremendously useful. And I use it both for myself and for my athletes as a kind of introduction to mindfulness and meditation. But I think, I think that the, the, the key for a good practice really would be to expand from um, any kind of external aid, like, like the app, to, to be more mindful um, throughout the day. And that's, that's something that I'm aiming to work towards more now is to have those moments when I remind myself that I'm drifting away from, from now to, to something else and to be conscious of the decisions that I make. The power of now, hey? Um, yeah. Are there any other mindset kind of development tools? Because I, I noticed through looking, uh, looking through the training plan website, there's a lot or there's a kind of a considerable, a considerable amount about developing mindset. What kind of techniques are you using? Man, I, I think that's a... Uh, <laughs> it's a big, big conversation, but I, I think that 
what I've found is that it starts, I think it starts with a vision. It starts with an idea of who do you want to be? I think that's where the mindset starts to build. Because I think in terms of motivation to exercise or to do things that are very difficult, your brain is constantly kind of going through this equation of the risk uh, or reward um, ratio and then looking at basically um, is, is what I'm trying to achieve compelling enough that it's worth the effort that I'm going through. Um, so I think it all starts by creating yourself a, a very strong vision of who you want to be and then understanding that to get to that vision, there's an amount of hard work that has to be put in and it becomes immensely more easy to put that work in if, if you know why you're doing it. I think when, when we're not really sure what we're trying to achieve or who we want to become, I think that's when the mindset work uh, becomes a little bit irrelevant or it becomes detached from the reality of, of, of what matters to you. And I think that's when you kind of get, it's easy to get lost in techniques. Um, I think it's the, the principles uh, of that clear vision and clarity of purpose that, that really matter the most. It's so nice to hear someone in the strength conditioning world say that. Um, I've got, like, I speak to a lot of people in the mindset world and they're kind of, and the best guys there are saying that it's all about who you want to be, particularly uh, Brian Grasso and Carrie Campbell. Um, they are saying that it's, it's all about who you want to be. It's not the why, it's not the, the what, and everyone gets so waylaid with the what, but the, the who is, is kind of the important thing to be, to be focusing on. So it's really nice to hear you kind of point that out. Yeah. I- I think it's, it's, it's this idea, old idea from Jim Rohn is that we set our goals for what they'll make of us to achieve them. And I think the whole idea of setting yourself lofty goals is so that you can become the person you could be. Exactly. You mentioned Jim Rohn there. Are there, mm-hmm. are there any kind of people in that, in that space that have influenced you particularly? Um, I think Jim Rohn has very greatly influenced me. I think his ideas around ambition being disciplined, eager desire for success in the service of others has been a really powerful driver for me. And then um, I've done a lot of work around um, Tony Robbins' materials, his seminars, etc. Nice. Have you, do you say you've been to Tony Robbins' seminars? <laughs> yeah. I, um, I've, I've done the, um, I, I guess, the curriculum. I've, 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 I've pretty much, if it exists, I've been there. For the most part, um, and it's been a really useful journey, and I think those those seminars, those events are really good um, reminders or opportunities for course correction. Mm, definitely. So you spoke there about the principles of of the mindset, but what principles do you consider to be the most important when it comes to programming? We talk about. Pro- I mean. I think the funny thing about programming and the principles is that uh, I really truly believe, truly believe that if you if you understand the principles, then you can choose the methods. But if you don't, then n- nothing really makes sense in terms of whatever we try to achieve. So I think for, in terms of strength and conditioning and, and just getting people to adapt, I think you need to do what you get better at. So the specificity, I think, is a very important principle. And, and the other one is uh, overload or progressive overload. So if you don't consistently challenge yourself with things that are more difficult than what you're used to. There is no opportunity for growth. So I think if you, if you do those two things, you choose what you want to do and you do it, and then you progressively make it more difficult for yourself and more challenging, uh, you can get really far. And then after that, we start to talk about things like managing your fatigue. So how much can you train? And I think there's a two ways to approach it, right? There's the one way is to train as little as possible to get, still a sufficient amount of benefits. And that, I think that works a lot of times with, so to speak, normal people who are not athletes, who are not thriving to be physically at their absolute best, but they just want to be fit and healthy. And then there's this idea of uh, training as hard as you can while still adapting and recovering. So this idea of a kind of maximum recoverable volume of training. And I think that's much more pertinent to, to people who really want to thrive in a, whether it's in athletics or something else is like, how much work can I put in and still reap the benefit of it? And I think this, you know, that, that idea of fatigue management just is basically deciding what, how much does this matter to you and deciding if you're going for the minimum effective dose or the maximum effective dose uh, between the two. So I would start with those three. I'm guessing that comes back to their goals then. If you're talking about minimum effective dose, whether they want, like, that comes back to probably a goal-setting session with yourself. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think this really applies. Like, 
I, I oftentimes think of this idea of what's the minimum viable knowledge? How little can I know about something for that information still to be useful in the context of what I do? And that context being the key. And I think it's the same thing for athletes is the context is really the key. The goal, what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to become in the pursuit of that is really the, the kind of the key determinant of how much effort should you be putting in into any one thing that you're doing um, in your life or in your training. Nice. And then when it comes to recovery, how are you, first of all, quantifying recovery? And then secondly, like how, what are the methods that you, your kind of go-to methods? Yeah, I think in terms of quantifying recovery, I found this to be a challenge. We've really kind of gone from things like solutions like Omega Wave, looking at heart rate variability and central nervous system, kind of DC potential and things like that, very fancy things, um, to a little bit more simple heart rate variability, to simply measuring your morning resting heart rate, weight loss, urine color, body temperature, etc. But But I think ultimately when, when you speak with athletes, you have to speak the language that matters to them. And I think that language oftentimes is performance. And, and one clear indication of that you've found a volume of training or intensity of training that's maybe excessive to your current capacity is that your performance starts to go down. So the goal of training is ultimately is to get better. And, and I believe that we should never be too far away from our optimal performance uh, because we're taking a bigger risk the further away we go each time that we might not be able to get back there. We might be going in the wrong direction. So what I like to use now uh, as the quantifier is really my athlete's performance um, while understanding that there's these other physiological markers um, on the background that are definitely interesting. And that performance could be the physical numbers or it could be their motivation to exercise and train and show up and then understand is that something to do with um, not recovering sufficiently, so not doing the right thing. So is that really, truly uh, training excessively uh, despite doing all the right things already? Okay. So do you prescribe to the idea of feeling your way through training at all because a lot of the coaches I'm speaking to at the moment it seems to be well it seems to be a, a fairly even split between quantifying everything and feeling your way through with only a few people in the middle so on that spectrum whereabouts do you fall I think this goes back to that like what matters is it your model of training or is it the athletes that you work with and I think if I look at the athletes that I work with, there's some who really benefit from going by feel and they've, they've developed that feel through years of experience. I think the idea that you have a feel from the day one, I, I think that's false. I think it's something that you might have to go through these different iterations of quantifying things very specifically or just getting the experience as an athlete to be able to develop that really feel for your body and where you are. But those athletes who've developed that, and I think that's a great goal to have is to be able to train that way. I think with them, the approach is different versus then people who are maybe more newcomers who need more kind of strict rules as to how things are or people who just really like and they thrive on those numbers and the kind of, so to speak, scientific um, approach to looking at uh, their performance and their recovery. So it really depends on the athlete, not on me. Uh, nice, nice. Um, that, that one size fits one thing is is so nice to hear as well. And um, in terms of the, the feeling your way through, I, I I think that people are kind of, I think people naturally have it, but just get covered up by life. Like you kind of, you lose the ability unless you're an athlete your whole life and you really understand your recovery. Yeah. And I think because we are losing touch in general with movements, I I think we are kind of outsourcing our movement to, to, to moving walkways and escalators and elevators, et cetera. So I think we, we are doing a great job at detaching ourselves from being good at feeling what's going on with our bodies. So when it comes to movement, how is, like I've, I've noted down, you put movement is our foundation and how do you go about ensuring this is the case with your athletes the whole time? Well, I think it, it's again, is that, that, that when I get to have that personal time one-to-one, it becomes much easier than when I'm doing my work um, online with, with larger groups of athletes. But in a sense, how I look at that movement as a foundation is um, I would, I would zoom out and take a, even a bigger picture view and, and, and really look at the, this idea of um, how, how does movement affect our daily life outside of training and how does that really become the foundation? I think that if I go really big picture, that the idea is that why do we have a brain is so that we can move. It's really from an evolutionary perspective that the fact that we can think and do all these fancy things is really nice, but the primary function of our brain 
is movement. So if it's not being used for what it needs to be, the biology is not respected, so to speak, I think that we're going to run into a lot of trouble. So that's kind of where the idea that movement is our foundation comes from. But movement is also the foundation from a perspective of putting in the quality work. And I think that really this idea that the, the quality of your training is the quality of the re- every single repetition because the repetition is the basic currency of your training. So that just means that when I program for athletes that I don't necessarily get to see, I try to organize the work in such a way that they have opportunities if they choose to do that, to, to watch themselves lift. That, that I, I encourage them to film. I encourage them to assess their own movement and to have coaches around them. Or I program things in ways using tempo where appropriate, um, et cetera, and using positions, holding positions where they have more opportunities to kind of do that error correction or to identify the faults in themselves. So it, it, is, it is challenging when you're asking the athletes to be their own critiques when oftentimes we just want to go fast and we don't necessarily care about how well we're doing things. But I'm, I'm definitely trying to create a culture and the way of prescribing exercise and movements that, that encourages people to examine what they're doing. And then secondly, trying to create the environments around the athletes where they have someone who can actually give them feedback. So I think that's so valuable regardless of who you are to just have somebody just say, hey, that looked weird. Or, hey, have you tried this? Or, hey, here's how you look. Here's the video. Let's change that. Okay. So when it comes to – actually, what, how many athletes are you working with on a kind of one-to-one basis at the moment? Um, one-to-one, I'd say very intensely, about six athletes, a little bit less intensely, about 15 athletes. And then after that, it's uh, when, when possible – with a, with a bigger group of athletes that I'm working with. Yeah. That must be very difficult to try and balance that, um, that trying to give as much as possible to these guys that, uh, um, and balancing that with trying to divide your time as well. Yeah, I think it's a, really the priorities um, are important. I, one of my original ideas with the training plan was really to see if we could scale this idea of having a professional team behind an athlete. I think in our sports, uh, in kind of competitive fitness, um, when I started, athletes were kind of by themselves, and then they start to have coaches, and then we start to have teams of coaches for the very best. Um, but I think so. That's what, what I'm trying to create, and that's that's where I kind of thrive is, is, is try to spend the time developing the, the methods and understanding the principles and building the teams around these best athletes. But then the other side of it is really using that as a tool to to scale when possible to, to a bigger group. So I think that one feeds to the other, but definitely uh, um, it is a challenge to, to manage the both at all times. Absolutely. When it comes to the actual practical application of, of building out a program, what, what are you starting with? Um, when I'm working with an individual athlete, I always see, I will start with the athlete. Um, I will start by trying to understand who they are, first of all, as a person and what they need and where they want to go, what their kind of dreams, aspirations and hopes are, and then see if I can play a part in that process. And, and, and if yes, I think it's very simple in a sense that I think this applies again to life and sport. We're going to win with our strengths and we're going to lose with our weaknesses. But we rarely do we win with our weaknesses. So I think it's very important when looking at an individual athlete to, to identify what they're already good at or what they have talent for and develop that so that once that's developed, now they have a true, true strength so that they can have a true weakness. And then we can go in the later stages, we can go after those weaknesses um, as well to create a more well-rounded athlete. But if, if you're kind of mediocre at everything, you're not really going to end up being at the top of the podium. So I think it's very important to appreciate the developing of the strengths, developing solid foundation first of all, of course, if they don't have that, but then thinking of how do we develop the strengths, how do we develop the weaknesses, and that obviously then plays into the program management in terms of what does this athlete need, do we need to work more on conditioning, is it strength, is it really a skill component that's lacking, um, what is it that could be maximized and what is it that we really need to, to tackle so that they don't have that big glare and weakness. When you talk about that foundation to begin with, what for you is a good foundation? Um, the, de- the obvious answer, obviously, would be movement. I think, I think the ability to do a good repetition is really the foundation. Because when we talk about stamina or strength, etc., what we're really talking about is different ways of overloading that one repetition. Either we do multiples or we make it heavier, we make it more challenging. 
So I think the foundation really truly is the skill to move well. And then we expand that skill by providing this different stimulus. So ultimately being able to do, whether it's to run a marathon or whether it's to do a really fast Fran or race or whatever that might be, it ultimately does come down to skill and its application. So I, I think we have to start there. Um, I see a lot of athletes being building tremendous work capacity, but there is no foundation of movement. And I think that's a uh, short term that gives you faster results long term. That's going to be a problem. And I th- something I see is um, especially with, with like guys that throw themselves into this and want to become the best athlete possible, they lose their love for the sport and they completely lose fun. How do you work on balancing that? Or do you kind of think that because these guys are trying to be the best in the world, you've got to just get on with them? I think, yeah, I, I think there's many layers to this. I want, number one is you have to decide what you really want. And I, I think I come across athletes also who would like to be good athletes, but they like to have fun more. And I think being honest with yourself about what you want is really, really important. If you really want to be truly best at something, you have to learn how to fall in love with boredom. If you don't know how to do the boring work, so to speak, then you're not going to get there because simply there are other people who will um, will do that. And nothing valuable was ever going to be easy. So I think it is important to accept that there is this boring aspect, so to speak, to training or challenging aspect to training if you truly want to be your best. But I think also that as you get better at something, you tend to enjoy it more as well. So oftentimes I think the work that's, that's hard is the work that we should be doing because we are not very good at the thing that we're trying to do. And that's why it's frustrating and boring. But if we'd be very good at it already, uh, we'd enjoy it. Even if it's very repetitive, we would enjoy it much more. Nice. When you started um, CrossFit and when you were first, actually, what was your first instruction to CrossFit? Um, I was, uh, I was living in Paris at the time. Um, I was studying Chinese medicine and I was doing martial arts, uh, Wing Chun, uh, kind of Southern Chinese martial arts. And, um, I was just, I was always curious. I was always looking for different strength and conditioning programs, information on the internet. And, uh, I just stumbled across CrossFit.com. It's kind of like early 2006. Um, and I found a workout that I, I could do because I didn't have any access to any weights. So it was, uh, four rounds, 400 meter run and 50 air squats. And, uh, it seemed so easy because I was doing squats all the time with martial arts. I was doing hundred squats every session, training 12 times a week. So I thought like, how hard can this be? And, uh, I remember distinctly, uh, running in, uh, Bois de Vincennes in, in Paris on my last round of that workout, thinking that I was still going pretty fast. And then seeing this old lady walk her dog past me. <laughs> have my dreams crushed and uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was my introduction I, it was kind of that point of humility of thinking that you were something and then realizing that that's not really what you were and that's what got me curious and the challenge and the, the opportunity to to test myself um, was what got me into it and what were the next steps in that process uh, for me, I think for some time it was kind of intermittent. Uh, it was kind of combined. I was, I was doing kind of CrossFit-esque training. And then every now and then when I saw workouts that I could do without really equipment, I would do it. So I'd end up in doing, for example, Cindy. So 20 minute unwrap, five push-ups, ten, uh, sorry, five pull-ups, 10 push-ups and 15 squats. I ended up doing it once a week for months and months on end up to a point that I was very good at doing Cindy because I could just go to a playground and anywhere where there was a bar and just, just get the workout done. And it was easy, fast, 25 minutes, and I was done, five-minute warm-up and into it. Um, so it kind of led me to realize when I went to the weight room for the first time that while I could do over 30 rounds in this workout and I thought I was really fit, but now when I went to deadlift a barbell that weighed 80 kilos, it was heavy for me. And it was, again, another point where I was like, oh, so this is not what fitness was. So I, I kind of got it, but I didn't quite get what CrossFit was at the time. And how did that change your approach to both training yourself and coaching others? Um, I think it made me realize that whenever you think you are the man and whenever you think you have all the answers, then, then, you, re- then you really haven't asked the right questions. Uh, it made me really appreciate how diverse um, these adaptations that we can get through to varied training are and, and what's possible for the human body. And I think watching the evolution 
of CrossFit and competitive fitness in general over the last years. It's, it is absolutely ridiculous what the athletes have nowadays can do, but I also think it's probably going to look like nothing in the next five to ten years. So I think I learned that lesson early on. It's like whatever you think is really good, it's, we are not there yet. Like, we're going to do so much better in the coming times. And if you think you're very good at something, like look again and see if you do get better. So where is typically the low-hanging fruit then? For, for in terms of, you mentioned that you think we're going to get a, a long way better in the, in the next kind of five to ten years. What kind of areas do you think we're going to massively improve in? Yeah, I think that's um, one of the things that it's definitely, I mean, we are barely learning how to crawl. Uh, is practice. Um, I think in general, CrossFitters um, are, are pretty good at training in terms of that they start to wake up to this idea that we, we need to do varied training. We need to not just always do train on 59, but, but to vary the content of our training and do different things and maybe sometimes be more progressive in the ways that we load. So it's a little bit more linear in our approach, sometimes a little bit more varied, more undulating. But I think that practice is something that very few people and very few people, to the level that if you go out and look at other, other sports, uh, what they're doing, we, we're just starting. Um, and I think that's when people wake up to the fact, oh, I, I can't just train. I also need to practice. And, and what is deliberate practice and what is purposeful practice or deep practice? And how is that different from the play time that we have at the gym, etc.? I think when we start to understand those concepts and we start to bring in some practices from other fields, that's when we will take another step forward. Is there anything that springs to mind when you think of those um, specific practices that you could kind of take aboard? Well, I think that the very simple, like the step for anyone who's going to the gym uh, and doing a workout is, is how to turn that to look a little bit more like practice is to just ask yourself why you're doing what you're doing. What will you be able to do at the end of the session that you couldn't do before? And, and, and just by being able to answer that question, you're going to focus that session into something specific. And whatever you pay attention to is, is where your opportunities to get better are. So you're doing a workout that calls for, let's say, power snatches, you can say, well, how efficiently could I cycle these power snatches to really identify the weaknesses that I might have? So it, it requires intention and it requires a critical eye um, to be able to do that. But this is something that I learned playing guitar that I played really badly um, from a guitar teacher that said, uh, attention is a price you must pay for, for progress. And I, I think that's the thing is that that's where people can start is pay attention to be present and to not just try to survive a workout and go or go as fast as they can go, but to go fast, but, but do it well and take a specific aspect that they focus on one thing at a time. Has there ever been a time where you've had to completely reassess your approach to coaching? Uh, every day. <laughs> <laughs> Correct answer. I, I, yeah, no, I, I, I really do feel that way. I, uh, um, yeah. example is this morning, uh, just uh, doing a bit of research um, for some of the different training methods. And, and, and just, just an example would be looking at something like blood flow restriction and, and looking at the mounting evidence that how beneficial it can be for athletes for strength gains and recovery, et cetera. And coming across a research piece that shows that this is probably true, but you also might suffer the risk of sudden cardiac death by doing it, even if you're a healthy individual, because of X, Y, Z mechanisms. So I, I think you know, that, that is not necessarily changing the coaching approach, but I feel like lessons like that come to me all the time. So I've learned to be careful about what I know and pretending to know more than I do. And I, I really think that the approach of asking questions rather than providing answers is a much more powerful one. Because when I have the answers, then the, the learning has been done. There's nothing more to learn. I have the answers. But when I have questions, then I'm always curious. So I think my practice changes consistently. And there's always new athletes um, that challenge me or new events that come. And they just change the way I think about the coaching. Nice. Are there any kind of parallels that you draw between coaching in life is there anything that's like kind of programming or coaching has taught you that you can apply to life or vice versa yeah i think about this a lot um and i think that really the key thing for me 
why programming is meaningful because it's really a thing. Okay, you are someone who has a goal. And you first have to understand where you are in relation to that goal. And then you have to create some kind of a logical progression that's going to move you from point A to point B or a system, a process that's going to move you progressively there that you can continue to correct um, as you learn new information. So I think the programming, in a sense, for me, is a metaphor for how to approach, uh, how to approach getting, getting what I want in other areas of life, not just um, in sport. Nice. When you're kind of, or what's your training like now personally? Um, so it, it varies because I, I do like to tinker around. So I like to experiment. So I, I oftentimes do change my programming kind of suddenly. I kind of get started with something and then I'm like, oh, I need to try this. A lot of that experimentation really is for others. So for me, it's better understand what I'm trying to apply and what I'm trying to prescribe for other athletes. But um, I try to be consistent. I think that on the, in the long term, showing up is really the most important attribute. Like if you stay in the game for long enough, you're going to be pretty good. And I think there's certain things that I need to do repeatedly. I, I, I go back to squatting because I'm good at it, so I like it. But it also is like I know that it's something that I can go back to. Um, I think movement quality is something I always go back to, so I, I will work on that uh, on a consistent basis. And I, I do always have a goal in my and then I try to now be conscious of setting more short-term goals. So about, you know, quarterly goals, what am I going to achieve in the next three months in my training? And then I can be more focused. And then once I have that goal, that journey can look, uh, it, it can be, I can take many different journeys to get to that goal. So it allows me some freedom to tinker around, but I know that this is, this is a target and I have some measures that I can look back to and be like, Hey, am I moving where I want to go? or is what I'm doing not working. So it's, it's really is varied. There's some back squats, there's some handstands, there's some running, some conditioning, and there's some skill work. Um, but it just really depends. And I, I, at any given time, when I tell you, this is what I'm doing now, tomorrow I might be doing something different. Does that, or is there anything else ex- aside, from, um, aside from CrossFit that you're, you're doing to train? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I don't know if I would call what I do now CrossFit. I... I I will try to do um, try to go outside as often as I can. I love to go climbing, uh, bouldering. I if whenever I get a chance to try something new that I haven't tried, I, I want to challenge myself. Um, I I would say that even the work that, that I do at the gym oftentimes is more applications of CrossFit than CrossFit. So I'm trying to kind of figure out how can I combine ideas from different fields into something. I, I think that the magic. Um, of CrossFit training really is in the movement selection. I think it's it's challenging yourself through these different movement patterns consistently, but, the, but there is enough repetition and it's systematic enough that to provide a stimulus that allows you to continue to grow even as, as, as you vary uh, the training consistently. But So I wouldn't call my, my training CrossFit at all, uh, but I would say that there's elements of CrossFit with applications in real life, trying to go outside the gym as often as I can. Are you still practicing martial arts? Um, not at the moment, unfortunately. I, I find myself thinking about this at least once a week that I would love to go back to. But I need to create. I travel very extensively at the moment, so it's it's very hard to go somewhere and be able to commit the time to be the teacher to be able to make progress. I think martial arts is something that's been I've been so serious about for a bigger part of my life that it would be very difficult for me to kind of casually do martial arts. I think I would have to go all in yeah. when I do go in. Are there any particular techniques that you use to combat the effects of traveling? Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There's there's quite a lot. Um, I think the time zone adaptations is it's it's a very important kind of piece, especially for athletes. But but if I try long haul, if I'm going to Australia, if I'm going to US, Africa, or some of these longer travels, I definitely try to be uh, careful about things like flight exposure to push the biological clocks in the right direction at the right times. Um, I do things like fasting on long flights um, to kind of give the digestion a rest and maybe reduce some of the stress of the, the travel. And I think just, you know, when you get somewhere, make sure that you've identified some good food choices, places to train, etc. I think a lot of it is preparation. 
and having a bit of a plan at the destination of how you're going to adapt to that time zone and to that environment as fast as you can so that you can do what you came to do. What for you makes a great coach? I think a great coach is, is someone who's not focused on themselves, but they're focused on the athlete. They're there really to, to be part of the athlete's journey. And I think a great coach goes beyond helping someone to be a physically a great performer. I think a great coach is going to help someone to not only be that great athlete, but, but more importantly, to help them to be a great person. And I think it's, it's, it's a combination of being a mentor and, and being someone who guides their physical journey. I, I think that's where you'll, you'll find a good coach. And are there any coaches that you think display that particularly well? You know, I would go outside of training and, and, and talk about, you know, Tony Robbins would be an example. I think there's some greats um, like John Wooden um, uh, from US who obviously has passed away. I, I, I think there are, there are great coaches in our field in, in, in CrossFit, but I, I oftentimes try to go outside and look for inspiration uh, elsewhere. So Tony Robbins, John Wooden would be the two big names that would come into my mind. Okay. And you mentioned you were practicing Chinese medicine. Where did that start? Yeah. Um, the, interest, uh, the interest in that start. Yeah. So I was, I moved to France when I was 20 and um, I found a martial arts teacher who was very good. And I kind of had in my mind that I'm going to train with him for 10 years and I'm going to do teach martial arts for a living. And about a year and a half into that process, I found a school of Chinese medicine in Paris. And um, I had, had an intent to actually do an apprenticeship back in, back in Finland with a Chinese medicine doctor, but that, that wasn't really practical in the end. But, but when I found out about the school, I, I kind of just thought that part of this idea of like idealistic idea of mastery of martial arts was that you can harm with your hands, you can heal with your hands. And that really got me got me on that journey what aspects of chinese medicine do you find most applicable i think that the really the key thing that i understood relatively early on in chinese medicine is that the way that the chinese language is structured did not allow me truly to penetrate the, the true essence of the chinese medicine but i i thought that unless i'm going to go and learn chinese and immerse myself in the culture it would be very difficult to truly be a great practitioner but I think that one of the best ideas that I got from it and that changed me the most is this idea of preventive medicine so that as a doctor, you get paid and your patients are healthy and you have to help them if they get sick rather than looking at, oh, you're already sick. Now you pay to come and see me. That was really the big thing. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. I, really, I really like that. What are the biggest changes that you, to take a complete left turn, what are the biggest changes that you think need to happen in CrossFit at the moment? Um, you know, I think, I think CrossFit is as it is. I don't know if it needs to change. I think overall the competitive fitness world, including CrossFit competitions and others, I, I really do, do think that this idea of practice is something that a lot of people could expand on and, and reflect on and, and then apply into their daily routines. Um, I think practice is, it's a practice lifestyle, but it's especially practice at the gym. And, and kind of looking around, I think the other thing is really to look around in the other fields, what people are doing in other sports and what people are doing outside of sports. What are the good ideas? I think that originally when CrossFit started, what was really beautiful is that it was this kind of emergence of these different ideas and thoughts coming together around this general theme of increased work capacity across sport time and model domains as a definition of fitness. And, and I think we've lost some of that. And I would love for that kind of pioneering mindset to come back into it. And people would be just experimenting more and coming up with more ideas and bringing more ideas from, from other fields and other experts outside of CrossFit. Is there anyone you feel is doing a good job of that now? In, in bringing across the kind of the new methodologies and kind of making headway within strength conditioning across it? Mm. You know, I, it's hard to say. I don't think that it's something that people necessarily talk about in terms of, of I think it's not necessarily always the conscious process for the good coaches that are actually doing it. Um, I see, I see a lot of new things coming into 
kind of the competitive aspects of our sport and what the coaches are doing and what the what the programs look like. I wouldn't necessarily be able to pinpoint a person um, who's doing it within within our sport. No, I'm trying to think, what to think, but no, I can't think of somebody. And that's not to say that people are not doing it. I just think it's it's kind of like inherent part of some people's process, and and therefore it's not very visible. Okay. Something I've been kind of toying around with the idea of recently is the the idea of, is originally brought up by Julien Pinot, like talking about volume versus intensity. And mm. I think there's a lot of, a lot of like um, boxes, especially programming very long emoms and a lot of volume in and kind of losing the intensity. And it's almost like falling into that trap of that runners get into with junk miles and just going and mm. going and going and going and building a kind of a fairly decent base, but losing the ability to be explosive um, and kind of losing the intensity in the skill work as well. Is this something that you've seen happen often? Uh, I think it's, it's potentially a trap, but I think the question to ask always is what is it for? So that long EMOM, if that's built so that an athlete can get feedback from the coach between the sets, um, between different movements to, to have access to a wide variety of movements in one training session at that moderate pace where they're, they're trying to develop the technique or the skill, while still being out of breath and accumulating some fatigue, that can be a great application. I think that, that the problem comes when people don't know what is it for. They don't know why they're doing what they're doing. I think that's more the challenge than necessarily too much volume or too much intensity or too little of either one. I think there's a time and place for everything. And I think that the problem is when the coach does not know why they're doing what they're doing. Okay. Is there, are there any athletes in the CrossFit do you think are particularly underrated at the moment? <laughs> that's an interesting question underrated as in that they have the potential to to kind of come out and win the crossfit games or yeah. um you know well like, i mean th- there's some really strong people coming into crossfit so i i, I just spent some time in iceland at crossfit Reykjavik working with annie and frederick and Pjörkvin and they, for example, have a guy called Thrusted. I'm not saying he's going to win the CrossFit Games anytime soon, but you know when you have these ex strongmen who can back squat 390 kilos, huh. and they start to develop some some work capacity and, and movement quality around typical kind of CrossFit movements. I, I think there's, there's there's so many people who just haven't yet discovered CrossFit, and when they do, that will absolutely destroy certain aspects of the the sport, at least destroy in a good way, as in the they will just show us some numbers and things that we have not yet seen. Um, but, you know, I think at this stage in our sport also, because the evolution is such that a couple of years ago, yeah, you could kind of be the dark horse and kind of come out of nowhere. And I think that, that the sport has evolved sufficiently. And even though I think that practice is really something that we are lacking, it's also developed to a point where it's, it is very difficult to just come out of nowhere and, and just all of a sudden kind of win the CrossFit game. So I think the people who will be on the podium for the next few years, we already know of. Uh, we don't know who they are, but we know their names. Okay. Um, and I think it's going to take somebody two to three years, even if with, you know, uh, incredible talent to, to, to get to that point. So I don't think there's going to be any big, huge surprises. If you had a almost completely blank canvas, so someone that was very not, not average, but average to good across the board, where would you in with your kind of attempt at programming for them if their goal was to win the games? I think if they would be incredibly average across the board, I would not try to program for them to win the games because I don't think that they would. I think that that, that you would need the person who is incredible at something um, for them to have the potential to win the games at this point. But, but if you're looking at overall for a crossfitter who just wants to be competitive, maybe, and they're, they're kind of relatively well-rounded, um, I would probably at first ask them the question as, are you really well-rounded? Did you really test enough things to find out? Because normally we'll find that there is some discrepancies there. Okay. We are good at some things and not so good at others. But I'd say if you truly are uh, an average uh, crossfitter who has aspirations to be, to be better, start with adding more practice into your work. It is the fastest way to get better today by doing things better. And if you do things better consistently, 
then you're going to consistently continue to improve and get better. And then focus that intent of practice into the things that you can be really truly good at. Focus on that first. First, get really good at something that you know you could be really good at. And once you're there, now you have a true weakness. And then it's time to address that weakness, but not before. It's, it's very interesting to hear you saying addressing the strengths first, because you it used to be the approach that if you finished kind of fifth or sixth in every event in the games, you'd win. Um, yeah. When do you think that changed? <laughs> when the scoring system changed? <laughs> I think, I mean, that, that definitely had a big impact. I mean, winning, it, it pays off to be a winner and it really does pay off, especially at the CrossFit Games. So it's, it's not sufficient anymore to be kind of be averagely good at everything, unless your average is top five on everything. But outside of that, you really need to have that capacity to win and then you need to have the capacity to minimize your losses. And then you need to also be able to manage that weekend or the week of competition and, and decide when is it time to go all out because you can win and when is it time to maybe back off a little bit so that you're going to minimize your losses, but you still have enough energy to come back to the next event and be able to win that. Are there any books or resources that you found particularly influenced your your training or your approach to programming or your kind of your approach to training in general, and they don't have to be uniquely from strength conditioning background. They could be from kind of any, any approach. Like for example, um, the power of now has influenced my, my, uh, my training a lot because it's allowed me to be present in training. Um, is there anything that's kind of influenced you in that way? Uh- Oh, wow. Where would I start? I, I do. Uh, I, I love reading. I, one of the books that influenced me the most in terms of programming, I think, was a software development book from the late 90s. It's called The Pragmatic Programmer, and it's by Andy Hunt and Dave Thomas. And these were the guys who are essentially behind the agile movement of software development. And I think the way that they look at developing computer software is the way that I look at developing human software, so to speak, how to develop human training programs. Um, especially the early parts of the book provide some really great insight into philosophy and systems of how to, how to write robust things that can be tested um, and stored for later use and then developed, therefore. Um, I think that's one of the books that's really influenced me the most in, in terms of looking at programming, more so than any, any programming book, because the programming books in strength and conditioning, they give a lot of methods, they give a lot of science, they give a lot of background understanding then what you i think what you need to develop is really a philosophy that's based around the principles and solid understanding of what they are are there any books that you've gifted on an often basis to others well, finally lately i've been giving away this book uh called the core by a finnish doctor called aki hintza uh, he's worked with formula one drivers um, he operated highly gap chalassi's knee he's a surgeon and he has some really good ideas that, that, that really match my thinking about the general looking at the athlete as a human being rather than looking at them as just as an athlete. So he has, he has this book that came out, I think, 2015. I, I, I bought the book recently when I was in Finland and I gifted it five times since um, just because I thought that that philosophy is so valuable for people who don't do sports, who are just looking to find a little bit of more purpose and structure into their life all the way to coaches and athletes who are really kind of striving to be the best they can be. Are there any daily routines that you follow? So either in the morning or the evening or around training, anything like that? Yeah, I think this is quite variable in, in terms of like, ironically, this, these routines come and go and they change. I'm trying to find out what really works for me. Um, I've certainly been two times when I, I, I have this elaborate 90 minute morning routines where I did everything from meditation and mobility work to, to reading and journaling. But I think the practices that I keep coming back to are journaling, putting my papers, uh, papers, my thoughts uh, on the paper, get them out of my head. Uh, I come back to meditation as a practice. I, I come to movement as a practice daily. So I make sure I'm doing something. And then really one of the big things, big drivers for me in life is learning. So, I do make sure that I learn something new, whether that's through a conversation, watching something or reading something uh, every single day. What are you learning from at the moment? Um, so lately, my reading, I would say, has been on the technical side of things, been looking at a lot of hypertrophy literature. I think it's a 
very interesting because it's such a studied field in terms of strength and conditioning because of the vanities. Say, can people have that there's hundreds and hundreds of research papers coming out every year and, and, and looking into the, the molecular mechanisms of muscle adaptation has been something very technical that I've been reading, um, reading lately. And, and, and then on the, on the other side, um, really looking at that book by Aki Hinta, the core has been really good at looking at the bigger picture of how, how, how do those specific details actually apply into the bigger concepts of human beings and, and becoming better. So I always try to read something technical and I always try to read something more philosophical or bigger picture at the same time. And do you mind sharing what your journaling practice looks like or your meditation practice? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so my journaling practice, it's funny enough, this started with, uh, in 2014, uh, with, uh, Kenny Kane, the owner of CrossFit LA. And, and we met up at the CrossFit games introduced by Carl Parley and, and, I went to spend some time with him and he was talking about his practice that he's been doing for years and years and years of just journaling this idea of morning pages, writing three pages, three hand, uh, first thing in the morning before the, the resistance, so to speak, if you're familiar with Stephen Pressfield's yeah. work before the resistance wakes so that so you're not so critical about what, what comes on paper. And that really frees the mind to do more meaningful things during the day. So that was kind of how we started. We actually had a phone call for a whole year, every single Wednesday, to talk about what we had written. And that was really valuable to, to have someone who I was accountable for to put in this work. Um, so that, that's where it started. And then it has moved on to being a little bit more sporadic now and also not so necessarily three pages at the time because that's, a, that's a quite a task, but to write the, the ideas down when they come. And so I'm not no longer so restricted to a time of the day, say it has to be morning. It's It's more... I've learned that I'll forget the good ideas that come into my mind at the time, so I will have to get them down as soon as possible and then with some time to reflect on what they mean and write around it. As far as the meditation, I, I simply use the Headspace app at the moment primarily because it's simple and I'm trying to move to the Pro Series so that I, I, I get to develop more independent practice so I don't need someone to help me and to prompt me um, mm, yeah. to, to put in. Yeah, I, I found... Uh... Headspace can be hard sometimes because you're kind of um, being prompted along the way. And sometimes it kind of, uh, it, it's excellent to get started. If you're new to meditation, I think it is fantastic, but it can kind of um, distract you occasionally. Um, as lovely as Andy Puddicombe's voice is. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's where my practice kind of expanding in terms of meditation is really breathing and breath awareness and focusing on that. So I, I kind of get to catch two things at the same time. I, I get to work on these breath awareness drills, but you know, it's very nature and how difficult it is. It's, it, it really is a good example of deliberate practice where the, the error rate is high and, and you're not always successful, but it, it forces you to stay present um, in that moment. So that, that's kind of where I'm shifting um, my meditation. Practice. How are you working on your breath work now? Um, so breath work, obviously, I mean, I think it's a kind of trendy topic nowadays with uh, Bim Hof. Have done a, has done a great job at, 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 in a sense popularizing breath work but I, I think even before you go and apply any of these specific methods or techniques I think the foundation of good breath work is breath awareness so simply asking are all my respiratory muscles working obviously to do that you have to know what they are and know what they're supposed to do but can you you know just simple palpation practice you know you can't really palpate your diaphragm but a lot of this other musculature your pec minor pec major serratus uh posterior superior etc you, you'll be able to palpate and just uh breathe and just feel is there movement is my ribcage expanding are there areas of stiffness and restriction and then using some measures i, I like a simple test of just trying just in a quiet breathing see how long you can inhale how long is your best inhale? And then spending some time, maybe five minutes of doing some focused breath work. You don't have to have too many mechanics. I think if you just kind of breathe and listen to your breath and see, ask yourself the questions like, hey, is the right front of my ribcage, is it expanding? Yes, no. If it's not expanding, can I make it to expand more? And just spend some time on that simple practice. And I guarantee you when you go back to that simple test of how long an inhale can I take, it is going to be significantly longer um, than what you had before. And I think that that's the foundation. Can I breathe in and can I breathe out and can I be aware of it and can I expand that capacity? Once you can do that, then there's very many fancy things that I think for athletes are very useful, like resisted training, 
let's say in these uh, resistive inspiration expiration machines, the inspiration seems to be more more valuable. And once you've developed some basic awareness and then some basic competency, I think that's when you start to bring in these specific breathing methods or techniques like the Wim Hof um, or other things. It's incredibly powerful. I, at the moment, I'm training for um, an ultra marathon in the Alps, and in particular, the the breath work has completely transformed my the, just the feel of running. It's um, and I've gone to breathing less, and I had Casper uh, van der Meulen, who's um, Wim Hof's kind of right hand guy on the show. Yeah. It was very interesting the way he's, he talked about um, breathing less. And I think that's got a direct carryover to, to CrossFit and the just chilling out in the workout. I think it really, really helps. I think um, so, so, so many people kind of get there like, go, go, go. And they breathe and they and it's uh, it freaks them out, to be honest. Yeah, they're trying too hard. I, I think there's, there's so many good things you touched on. I think most of us are not under breathing. We are over breathing. We are breathing way too hard for the amount of exertion that we're going through on the daily life. And I think learning to quiet that down is, is so powerful in terms of that parasympathetic stimulus and being able to recover and focus. And then I think that you touched on that two things that are important. Ultimately, the breath work has to be tied into your movement. That's, that's how it's intended to be. And, and I think that this concept of movement should breathe you when you're running that, that impact with the ground or that contact with the ground should be sufficient to breathe you, the more you have to put in muscular effort, the more cost it is for you in terms of energy management, the harder life and exercise is going to be. And I think the other side that's very interesting and important is this, uh, the air hunger or the fear of lack of air. And, and, and your brain is always looking to survive. It's not looking to look good or perform well. It's looking to survive in that moment, short term. So when we experience that air hunger, that primitive fear, oftentimes is what limits us in terms of our performance. Oh, definitely. Um, something else that's uh, I wouldn't expect to have a, a big carryover has been the swimming. Um, but just because I've I've never swum with my face down, I was an awful swimmer, and like just having mm. my face underwater and like this is when I inhale, this is when I exhale, because otherwise I'll drown. It's quite a <laughs> quite a nice thing to to have to do. And then to be comfortable when your face is in the water and knowing that the the air is there, it's coming, but you you don't need it right now. You can be okay. Exactly. That's exactly it. What would you have told your, let's say, 20-year-old self if you were going to like, get him to, to be the best programmer possible in the shortest amount of time? I think in general, I would just say like it's not too late. I think I've, I've, oftentimes when I was younger, I always thought it was too late to do something. Um, and I think now I realize that <laughs> it's always too late. Just, you know, it's, 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 it's never too late to start, but it's always too late not to. And, and, and I think before that was something that was holding me back is that I was thought like, Oh, I should have started this at this age or this age at this age. And I, I think that's all BS and something that I bought into way too long. Mm. Um, there's the best time to plant a tree was yesterday, but the second best time is right now. Exactly. Are there any yeah, exactly. phrases or uh, mantras that you find particularly helpful or you use on a daily basis? I think, I think there's two that I think of often. One is from the book Resilience by Eric Graytons, and he said, if we are intentional about what we repeatedly do, we can practice who we want to become. And through practice, we can become who we want to be. And I think that's something I think about all the time, is you're in the process of becoming who you will be. So be careful of what you do and be conscious of what you do. I think that's really really something that drives me because I, I do think that whatever we're doing right now is what we're getting better at. So, you know, if you spend your time complaining about things, you get really good at complaining. But if you take your time taking action to move things to be like you want them to be or to make you be how you want to be, then, then that's also going to take place. So that, that's something that's really powerful that really does drive me um, every day. Nice. And, and the other side of this is that it is, it is to get lost in the process and value the process more than the results, but the results ultimately in the real life, they do matter. So there's a guy called um, William James, who was the kind of father of pragmatic philosophy, who said that success is an inner ideal followed persistently with courage and an external manifestation of that idea. So I think that's really important is that as you're pursuing to be a better self, you don't also want to get lost on that side and just think that because you're in this process that everything is okay there needs to be some external checkpoints and manifestations that, that tell you that you're actually on the right path 
Nice. You've mentioned philosophy quite a few times. Are there any philosophers that you follow in particular or anything you've drawn from in particular? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's something that's been a kind of lifelong, lifelong study. Um, whether it's some old Taoist writings or, or what's very trendy nowadays, of course, is this like uh, mm. philosophy. I, I remember being 18 years old and coming across this saying by Epictetus, which was, uh, men are not disturbed by things, but by their perception of things. And that's also something that's really stuck with me. And, and so that Stoic philosophy has always been very close to my heart. Obviously, being Finnish, I think that helps. It's kind of like culturally, culturally uh, something that we must kind of say at least that we do. But, but I, think, I think that really those two things, the kind of the more the Eastern philosophies and then the Stoicism have uh, two movements that have influenced my thinking the most. Do you practice either of those or do you have a, a kind of a particular practice in regards to those? Is there any kind of practical lessons that you've taken from them? I think that the, the big, biggest lesson is that what I just um, mentioned in that, in that quote by Epictetus is that, uh, you know, it, it's the problem of problem. <laughs> is the problem still a problem if you don't think it's a problem kind of thing. It's like, it, it really is. There is no, I, I don't believe I go metaphysical about it. I don't think that there is a perception, you know, there is this thing called reality. That's just the meaning that our brains give to the input uh, based on the previous experiences that we have. And so I think that stoic philosophy and idea of really is what, how you perceive things to be is how they are. And they are not a problem. If you don't think they're a problem, they can be an opportunity as well. And that's something that, that kind of definitely guides me in daily life. Is there anyone who has particularly guided you, a particular coach or um, a figure in your life that's kind of brought you to this point and you kind of, um, you think, taught you particular lessons? I think, you know, I, I think it's this like, idea of standing in the shoulders of giants, but just standing on the shoulders of normal people as well. I, I think my first judo coach really taught me a lot. I remember this, one of the lessons that I learned when I... I I believe I was 13 or 12 and I got my green belt in judo and at green belt you get to learn the arm bars and the chokes. But because I was too young, um, he would not teach me this. And I had worked so hard to get this prize that was not the belt but was the right to learn this knowledge. And then he basically denied me. He was like, no, you, this, you're not ready yet. And, 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 and I think that was one of the most powerful lessons that I had in in terms of, you know, you're entitled to, to put in the work, but you are not entitled to get the rewards from the work. Um, that really influenced me. And I think that approaching things with that mindset, I think it's very useful. I think it, it, it makes you value the process um, in a sense over the outcome, knowing that the outcome is important, but if you don't get the outcome, you still have the process and, and you became something because of that. Um, that was one of the big lessons I think I learned early on uh, from my judo coach. What has been your best investment recently and I, I like that investment can be monetary or it can be time or it can be effort um there's a few things that kind of spring to mind for myself like actually investing in one of the worst coaches i've ever had was one of the best things i did because it taught me it taught me what i shouldn't be doing in coaching um so is there anything that uh, that springs to mind that is your best investment uh. I think one of the good practical investments that I made is just buying these travel uh, food scales. Um, okay. Be able to kind of check in on my accuracy and precision on my what I'm putting in in my mouth. And some, some surprises that have come through that turns out the GPK Mighty Burger is, uh, has a lot of macronutrients um, in it. I, I think that that has been very valuable because it's it's kind of allowed me to question some of the beliefs that I had and some of the things that I took for granted. What kind of nutrition method or theories are you following at the moment? I try to not to stick to methods. I, I really try to go to those idea of principles. I think if I look at the principles that I think that matter, I think it matters, especially as an athlete, it matters how much you eat, are you getting enough energy? I think it matters to, to have the building block. So am I getting enough protein? to support the adaptations and support my body. Am I getting enough carbohydrates to support high intensity exercise and strength training? And am I getting enough uh, healthy fats, essential fatty acids to, to basically keep my cells healthy? I think those things matter a lot. I've been tinkering al around with uh, a lot of nutrient timing just in terms of, you know, 
keeping the fiber and the fat outside of the training time, keeping the carbohydrates in my training time. And I think that's been very, very beneficial. And then, you know, food quality is something that's always, I think, is important. Where, where, where does the energy and where do those macronutrients come from? And then really also trying to, I think sometimes we tend to add more things into our practice when taking things away from our practice is more useful. And I think in terms of like supplements, for example, just really taking the kind of the, what I think is the minimum effective dose for what I'm working for at the moment. So I would just kind of keep it simple, you know, not, not to be too strict, not to ascribe to a certain methodology, but just start with some solid principles and then you have a lot of freedom. But then nice. Something that I hear like time, time again is the idea of elegance. And that's essentially that, like what can you take away and still get the same, the same results and like how much fat can you trim from what you're doing and still get the same results, if not better. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that, that kind of thinking of via negative of thinking, I think it's, it's, it's really powerful. Don't add more, just take, take the unessential away. Exactly. And then the last question, is there anything that you believe that you, that others will find controversial? Mm, I think some people, some people don't. I, I think that one of the things I do believe that I, I feel like a lot of people find controversial is just this idea that I think that we are here to be better. I think we're here to be better for ourselves and, and, and and for others, for, for you know, for a species as a whole, and I, it always astounds me when people are not striving to be the very best, striving to be the very best they could be. You know, mm. when they stop asking the questions and stop trying to develop. So I think it's something that a lot of people passively don't believe that I do believe in terms of they're not taking the actions on a daily basis. And there are many people who do, and I really truly respect them. I, I'm always inspired by people who want to be better, but people who don't want to be better who are kind of uh, content with who they are today, um, regardless of who you are, you can always be something more, something better, something more useful for others than yourself. So I think that's something that maybe not everyone would agree with me. I think that is an awesome place to end the show. Uh, where can people find out a bit more about Yami? Um, if they're interested in training, uh, the trainingplan.co um, is where they can find me. They can also find me on Instagram, Yami. Ikkonen, very simple. Um, and that's probably the best two places to, to find me at the moment. All right, awesome. Thank you so much for jumping on the show. Um, it's been one of my favorites that I've recorded recently. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Alpha Movement Podcast. This episode was live streamed in my free Facebook group, Alpha Athletes page 2.0, where you can get priority access to the guests. You can ask your questions via me to them and get them answered. You can stay up to date with the latest goings on in the Alpha Movement world and you can access me my ramblings my posts and all the fun stuff also if you enjoy the show you can head over to patreon.com slash alpha movement podcast and you can pledge however much you want per month um, just to keep the show on the road it's a it's something that sucks up a lot of time well i say sucks up it's the absolute pleasure to do but it sucks up time in some way it sucks up um, my money and resource and i want to keep this going for as long as i can because i know how much you guys get from this show so if you head over to uh, patreon.com slash alpha movement podcast you can pledge as little or as much as you want every single month and you can cancel it whenever you'd like and it just helps to keep the show going other than that if you head over to itunes you can find us leave a five star review if you enjoyed the show and you can find us on social media this show relies on your support um so you spread the word if you enjoy it reach out to whoever my guest was this week and myself say you enjoyed the show and i shall see you soon for another episode of the alpha movement podcast Bye.